All right, so today I'm gonna to be talking about the unexpected Internet of Things. This is basically a lot about what we've been seeing at Timbu in terms of where IoT is being adopted and where there's interest in IoT and who's actually putting IoT in place right now. So first off, about me, I'm Vaughn, obviously. I'm a head of product outreach at Timbu, and so what that means is uh, I work with our customers to get them up and running uh, with Timbu. And uh, here's a picture of me with uh, R2-T2 at Maker Faire a few years ago. So just a quick note about what is Timbu. So Timbu is a software as a service product for developers and companies looking to basically connect sensors and actuators to the cloud or any cloud service. And our customers use Timbu to generate production-ready code using our platform to create all sorts of IoT applications. And Often, in terms of the actual customers who are using our product, uh, they often come with a from an educational or training background in mechanical or electrical or chemical or factory uh, engineering. So I take it everyone here is probably familiar with the Internet of Things and has a pretty good sense of, of what it is. So you know we see all these big predictions thrown around all, all the time. Here's one from IDC about. 22 billion IoT devices uh, being in the world by uh, 2018, or things like when you know Gartner says uh, over half of new business processes uh, will incorporate aspects of IoT by 2020. Um, and at the same time, we also see kind of as on the top and bottom of this uh, slide here, kind of all of the connected or smart uh, products that are coming out all the time. You're probably buying them or reading about them at the very least. But, you know, when you think about 22 billion IoT devices by 2018 or half of all business processes by 2020 involving IoT in some way or another, you know, what actually are those processes and, and devices? Where are they going to be coming from? Are they coming from products like this or is there maybe a, a broader range of IoT out there that's actually getting less coverage? And the fact is, is yes, there is, and it's already happening. And you know, our opinion at Timbu is that this is going to be the main driver of actually getting to 22 uh, billion IoT devices, or really things that are like connected sensors or connected actuators. And to sort of get a sense of scale, I was looking earlier today, and you know, since 2007, in total, there have been one billion uh, iPhones sold. To give you a sense of what 1 billion is and what 22 billion uh, looks like. Or even today, there's about 2 to 3 billion people with smartphones uh, currently. Um, and by 2020, you know, when we'll have more than 22 billion IoT devices, it's projected to be about 6 billion uh, smartphone users at the time. So that just sort of gives you a sense of scale there. So what is actually you know, happening in IoT that maybe we're not uh, reading about or seeing about as much, and what our business is actually doing today with connected sensors and actuators, and what are the actual things in the Internet of Things that we might not be expecting? Well, how about cake? So, uh, Montini's Foods uh, is a large food company specializing in cakes and pastries. Uh, they are uh, based in India. They have 14 factories across India and the Middle East. Uh, they serve 20,000 retailers in India alone, and they have a wide international distribution through India, UK, and uh, uh, Europe and the Middle East and Africa. So how do they go from this to this? Um, well, for one, no, they're not putting chips in cakes or pastries or anything like that. Um, and, you know, they didn't build a new factory or reconfigure an existing one expensively uh, to bring it up into IoT. What they've actually done is they've retrofitted a lot of existing equipment and processes quickly and at low cost uh, to implement the Internet of Things to reduce waste and increase efficiencies. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about what exactly they've done. So at the top left here, uh, you can see uh, what looks like kind of like what might be a machine you would see at TSA, but it actually has you know food going in it. Um, and so first at Mangini's, they had factory engineers retrofit their food and X-ray scanning machines. Now I wasn't very familiar with these before uh, 
you know, we started working with Mangini's, but basically these machines scan every cake and pastry at their factories to check for impurities like trace metals. Um, and at their Mumbai factory alone, they're scanning 20,000 cakes a day. Um, and so they have to do this basically to comply with safety protocols set by the International Standards Organization. And, you know, previously, or when they first had these machines, they weren't connected. They literally had to have someone standing there looking at uh, the machines like you see in the picture and basically see what light bulb, uh, what warning light was flashing and that would indicate what type of food uh, impurity was happening. Now, you can easily spend tens of thousands, maybe even like $50,000 uh, on these machines and they last for a long time, like at least 10 years. So fully replacing them just to get them connected is pretty impractical. And what Mongenies did is they used basically just low cost, easily available hardware, hardware we're probably all familiar with here, like, um, and sensors basically to connect these machines to the internet to automate alerts, records, and communication with their quality assurance team. And then they rolled out this to more production lines and factories. So basically once they had gone in the top left and figured out how to retrofit this equipment, they started looking for other ideas. And basically, you can see at the top right, uh, they went and looked at their freezers and refrigerators where they store all the cakes. And they realized that they could use the Internet of Things to monitor these as well. And again, rather than replacing their freezers and refrigerators, they were able to use off-the-shelf temperature sensors and simple hardware that they connected their freezers and refrigerators to have data logging functions and alert functions and basically anything to reduce the chance of food spoilage or anything like that. Um, after that, they basically realized, oh, actually we have this great temperature logging uh, application. Well, we can actually just replace the temperature sensor uh, with one that works instead of in cold temperatures to hot temperatures and instantly they have an oven monitoring application, which now they're using as well. And once these ideas have started being implemented and rolled out to more and more factories, basically now they move to the bottom right. And this is what's next for Mongenius, is basically using all the data and the expertise from these current IoT applications that they've uh, built and integrating all of those with their payment and logistic systems to basically find new applications and new ways to make those more efficient as well. So basically what Mangini's did is they really started with a single concrete problem that was fairly simple and straightforward and found a way to improve their factories and implemented them quickly at a low cost and then that just led to more and more applications and learnings. So you know, starting simple can actually have really impressive results and help you really build momentum. So I'll show you a little bit about you know, how they did this and basically this is a little bit about what our product actually looks like but uh, they connected the hardware and sensors to the internet and to various different cloud services using code that they generated using our platform. So basically, when they have a Timbu account, they can go to our website and generate code. It looks a bit like this is actually what it looks like uh, when you're generating it, and then they can copy and paste that into their uh, IDE and uh, upload that into their applications and uh, be connected to uh, cloud services and handle all of the sensor connections uh, as well. And again, this is just an example of the type of remote monitoring and control uh, that Timbu enables for Mongini so that they can look at sensor graphs remotely and turn uh, off and on and actuators wherever they are. So Mongini's is just uh, one example, but who else is putting connected sensors and actuators to work or who else is planning to? Um, basically every week uh, at Timbu we talk to companies and engineers in all sorts of industries uh, looking to implement IoT. This is just an example list here. Uh, you know, some are just kicking the tires, but many have real uh, concrete problems that they're looking to solve. So take agriculture. So we have one customer in Canada that's built uh, an automated irrigation system for farms and greenhouses uh, with a network of sensors basically detecting things like soil, uh, electrical conductivity, moisture plus light, temperature, and other soil chemistry uh, sensors to manage plant watering for plants and greenhouses and farms. Um, take aviation. So we have another customer uh, in the UK. They are a, in the airline industry, they're an MRO. This is a maintenance repair and overhaul uh, company. Basically they repair uh, airplane parts uh, to keep 
planes running and you know changing out uh, different parts as they need uh, servicing and all of that. So what they did is they used connected sensors to monitor their airplane parts storage facility. Uh, and it now has automated alerts and sensor data, sensor data logging functions to log the temperature and humidity of their storage facilities to know that the parts are being stored correctly. And they also are able to uh, track the status with this application of all the technical manuals that are stored in this facility for repairing all the airplane parts. So they have basically like a library checkout log of that. And then they have basically all of these automated records uh, time stamped with the temperature and humidity of the storage facilities. And when they get audited by the FAA or other regulatory agencies, they can hand that over uh, as part of their audit process, as part of their compliance process to demonstrate uh, that they have everything under control. So take uh, manufacturing. Um, so we have another customer. They're an Italian manufacturing firm. They're building quieter uh, lawnmowers and also self-driving lawnmowers, which is pretty cool. And they have embedded all sorts of connected sensors inside their engines to track basically all sorts of engine vitals, things like RPMs, temperature, blade tension, what have you. And they can visualize all of that data in real time and then analyze that data against data that's pulled in from other services like weather data, um, and things like that to really get a sense of how their engines are performing under real conditions and how they perform against uh, reported weather conditions and everything like that. So those are just a few examples, but how are all these different companies uh, with different needs in different parts of the world actually using uh, IoT or how do they figure it out? Um, well, for one, what we see is Despite all the variety, and there's a ton of variety in all the different industries that are using IoT, um, they basically fall into three overlapping sets of functions, triggered notifications, sensor monitoring, and actuator control. And the settings and benefits may, may differ, but the general scheme or application logic behind these applications is quite, simple, uh, is quite similar. And while this may sound simple, the devil is really in the details. Combining things like sensors, hardware, power supplies, internet co connectivity, machine-to-machine -machine messaging protocols, APIs, and cloud services, and tying them all together and getting them to actually work in reality is, um, is really where there's a lot of difficulty. And basically, these slides here are really just scratching the surface of the variability in terms of sensors and actuators, but there's thousands more. And really underestimating the difficulty of combining all these components together is, is a big risk because it's something that we spend a lot of time on at Timbu as we work to basically automate code generation that smooths over all of these rough edges to fit all these component parts together so that our, cu our customers and companies that use us don't have to worry about all of these things. So having spoken with a lot of companies, uh, working with Timbu, having worked with a lot of them, you know, how, how do companies really adopt IoT? What are the kind of best practices here? So I have seven tips uh, for them. Uh, the first one is really just start with a small but real concrete problem. Um, you know, don't try to overdo it or over-engineer it. Just start with one simple thing, even if it seems basic. Because uh, trying to do too much in terms of functionality, data, automation, often means that the application actually never gets built. Uh, at least that's what I've seen a lot. Um, focus really on saving time or money to create real value at the start. Um, this often includes activities that, things like, you know, where maintenance technicians have to uh, check things physically, or uh, systems that can prevent or alert more serious waste or failures with early detection, like the refrigerator, refrigerator monitors, uh, for example. If you see that the temperature is getting too warm, you can avert a lot of wasted food and get a technician there quickly. Um, you know, quick wins will really help build confidence and expertise for IoT. Um, this is kind of the thing about the a human element in IoT in terms of companies actually adopting it in their processes is that um, there often isn't really a hard deadline for these types of projects because they're not really fully baked into companies yet. And so maintaining momentum with a, with a you know, achievable goal and a quick win is really important. And it also helps, again, to you know, get internal backing based on having a, a working system. So if you're immediately saving money at the start, you know, you're kind of 
helping, and that's the human element again. Uh, see how the data and functionality you've created can have additional uses. So one instance is the airplane parts company, they have this data log, they realize, oh, it's not just good for our own records, but we can use it for uh, FAA compliance. See how your existing applications can be modified for other uses, the example of being uh, Mangini's with their uh, regional monitoring application and just saying, hey, we could take this application and make one modification. We have an oven monitoring application. And finally, uh, build new I IoT capabilities on top of existing ones. So really, it's, don't throw out what you already have, at least not yet, um, because it's not worth taking that risk uh, right now to throw out your whole working system, but you can build on top of that some simple applications, you can really learn kind of how IoT can help your business. And finally here, I just want to take a step back and get a sense of the scale of what the predicted 22 billion IoT devices I mentioned earlier are going to be doing. Um, so while many will be in smart products and things like that, you know, many more are going to be in factories and infrastructure and storage facilities, pipes, and unexpected places that we don't see. I mean, that's actually kind of the point. Like you want, that's why you have the connectivity so you can get to these hard to access uh, places, um, places that are figuratively and often literally underground. Um, and you can sort of get a sense of the big problems that all of these, you know, individual devices that are saving resources or uh, making things more efficient can help, whether it's, you know, reducing the 1.5 trillion uh, liters of water that are wasted every year in agriculture, all the vaccines that are lost, all the pounds of food that are lost uh, to food recalls and things like that. And there's really just a huge market, uh, there's huge market opportunities and huge opportunities for making the world better at the same time. And this is really all we see, you know, this is just the beginning, this is what we see right now in just in terms of making things more efficient in the next few years, but really IoT is gonna reshape industries in all sorts of unexpected and invisible ways uh, that we can't even imagine yet. So, that's it. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Uh, Hi. Uh, Hi. Hey. Uh, so it's a platform that the client uploads the data and then it automatically does some predictions. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about oh, that? Yeah, or? I can talk a little bit more. So basically the okay. way that the platform works is uh, the uh, customers build the applications themselves. They use our platform to basically get automatically generated code for doing the connect the data connection part. So before they build something. Basic yes. Okay. Yes. Typically, yeah, they'll they'll you know have something that they want to monitor. They'll have a they'll start getting a sensor, uh, a hardware board that's out there, and then they'll say, okay, I want this uh, temperature sensor to log data every hour or trigger an SMS notification whenever it does this. And kind of that portion <laughs> of the application is what we automatically generate code for. Okay. Um, yep. As a company that's generating the software, what trends do you see in terms of communications, in terms of frequency data is, uh, data is loaded up, types of communication networks, protocols, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we see everything. There's so much uh, variety on how people are attacking it. I think what I often see is people first want everything to be real time, immediate, and then once they start seeing the the basically cost of that, either in uh, how much battery they're going to have to have on this thing or how much data they're going to have to s store um, and actually think about the functionality of what they're doing, they often realize that actually, you know, some things need immediate response time, some things can do every five minutes, some things can do once an hour or once a day, it really depends on the frequency. I think like maybe the airplane parts storage facility is maybe once an hour, um, but I often see things that are just, you know, once a day, uh, the, the frequency really varies. Um, you know, mostly, we get a lot of questions about various communication protocols, but, you know, most of what we see is still, you know, Wi-Fi or, or Ethernet. Um, and we, you know, we have support for things like uh, MQTT and other, like, machine-to-machine -machine messaging protocols, but, Primarily, we still see a lot of uh, Wi-Fi and, and Ethernet at this point, and and occasional uh, GSM and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
So you spoke about this a little bit in terms of the difficulty of combining like off the shelf components into yep. something that worked. So do you give guidance to your clients about how to do that or make recommendations in terms of what sensors to use yeah. together? Yeah, we do. I mean, we, we give a lot of guidance. Often our, our customers, you know, are, are, are set for because of something that they've already bought or they know that it's actually, you know, this type of sensor is really going to work well under the specific environmental conditions that they're going to use, uh, that, that's going to be in, that they'll go with that. But um, we provide a lot of guidance there. We have a number of actual sensor types that are kind of pre-integrated into our, our platform so that if you happen to actually be using a particular type of temperature sensor or something like that, we can recognize that and automatically do like unit conversions for you. But I mean, the list of sensors is you know kind of infinitely long. So obviously, there's tons more that uh, aren't pre-integrated into our platform, and we can provide guidance on how to basically calibrate and, and get all of that uh, in there. Great. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.